Hello, everyone. Um, we've been asked to just say a few words about what we think the future of fundraising is. Um, and I'm not going to talk about technology because I think there's plenty of other people here who are better positioned to talk about technology than I am. But I think the future of fundraising is in three things because I think fundraisers need to follow where money is going. I think that's the future. Follow where the money in society is going. And that means the wealthy, because there's more rich people around than ever before. They're richer than ever before, and they're not being asked enough, so we need to do that more. It means older people, uh, particularly the baby boomers. They are the ones with the money in our society. There's a huge, vast array of people there, and a lot of charity marketing is targeted either at your typical Dorothy donor, who's a bit older than that, or at younger people who, frankly, don't have the money. I think we're missing the baby boomers. That's where the future is about targeting. And finally, money is moving into property. And that means that people can't always access it during their lifetime, but they've got a lot of money to give when they die. Legacy fundraising is the future. So that's my three tips for the future of fundraising. Major donors, focus on baby boomers, think about legacies. So I am going to talk about technology. Surprise, surprise, I work for a website. Um, for me, what's really interesting that's coming out of not necessarily the sector, but of people giving at the moment, is that people are starting to give not to charities, but to actually give to each other in order to achieve things that charities used to do. So just to give quite a specific example, um, if you look at some of the crowdfunding platforms, there's a lot of activities for individuals who want to go to Syria themselves to, do, to help out, or there's lots of examples of... Um, people who are going to the jungle in Calais and they're using their own skills to help out where charities would have previously been those people. Um, so I think it's especially true in the UK when people don't think charities are transparent enough. The media is attacking the charity sector at the moment. And I think the charity, to, to survive in the future as a charity, we need to start behaving more like our supporters are behaving and stop behaving like charities used to. That's it. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I've got three points, but I'd actually echo the last point, um, which is because we're seeing this at Just Giving Ourselves in terms of crowdfunding. And I think one of the reasons why people are starting to turn to crowdfunding um, is because they get something in return. Um, and that's the quality of the story. That's the, um, the journey that they're taking on in, in return for their £10, in return for their £50. They're learning about how that money is spent and how that money is making a difference. Um, and that was really my first point in terms of the future of um, fundraising. I think it's in the art of the storytelling. Um, charities have stories to tell. Um, you have great news. You have amazing things that you are doing. I'm not convinced yet that you are necessarily all doing a great job of telling that story and sharing it. And there are so many new and exciting ways in which you can tell stories now in which you can, and, and how you can keep people informed. That I think um, if charities can harness those, um, you're going to be uh, very successful. Uh, second point was um, advocates. Um, I think um, not only are your current supporters um, supporting you and, and people that you want to um, understand very well, and I'd always, always encourage charities to know who your very important fundraisers are, your VIFs. Um, know them, know everything about them, know the name of their dog. You, know, you should be looking after them like any brand looks after their top customers. Um, Taking that next level, those people are also, they're your advocates, and they're going to be the people that get you your, your next cohort of supporters. Um, so, you know, use your best supporters to be your future advocates. And racking my brain, my third point was uh, more about approach, and, and it's, I think, the charities that will be successful in the future are the ones that um, are agile and nimble, the ones that can move fast, the ones that can change, the ones that can pivot, the ones that can react quickly to whatever's um, happening or whatever the zeitgeist is, those will be the ones that I think are going to be uh, successful. So I'm um, happy to talk about any of those points, really. Thank you. Right, I'm really glad I've gone last. Um, there's, um, we've got nine really good tips there. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm Lisa. I've got no more tips left. No, I, 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 slightly different brief. Um, I, I, I had, talk about your background, your pride, and why you're passionate about fundraising. Will that do? <laughs> Handy. Handy. Well, I will actually, uh, just to make it ten, as an ad lib, I'll offer you my tenth, the tenth tip of tonight. 
And as a grant maker, this is what I do when I go out and see um, potential grantees who are worrying about um, sending an application to me for me to judge. And uh, I'll normally go and have a visit with them, which is a bit unprecedented, and I'll talk to them about their fundraising strategy. And they'll tell me, um, they're usually terribly stressed, actually, because they've been really frightened about me coming, because obviously I'm a very scary person. And, um, and, and also they're under huge pressure to raise the money that they need in order to not sack somebody at the end of the year. And, uh, so, and they've usually got trustees who have given lots of very useful and helpful advice. Any trustees in the room? No, I won't ask. Um, but um, no, um, glad, glad you are. Um, but lots of very helpful advice from people who have never worked in charities uh, or never done any fundraising uh, about what they should be doing. And my, my philosophy is what I describe as the ready, steady, cook philosophy of fundraising. And by that I mean, I mean, you don't have to admit that you've ever watched the daytime television program Ready, Steady, Cook. But those of you who have will just, you know what I'm talking about here. If you tip out that carrier bag and you have got apples, blackberries, some brown sugar and a bit of butter, you can make a very, very nice blackberry and apple crumble. But what you can't make is a chili and tomato soup with it. And all too many charities that I go and see are being forced by their trustees down a particular road uh, because somebody else's charity made a lot of money doing it that way. And that's not part of their core competence. They've not got the core ingredients. Uh, that's where my analogy with food comes from. Um, also because I originally trained as a home economist, so I can't help myself from re reducing everything to its um, component edible ingredients. Um, but you can't do something that works for another charity if you're not that charity and you haven't got that same number or type of supporter. So I use a very, very simplistic way to try and reassure the charities that actually let's just have a look at the ingredients you have got and then work up a recipe for fundraising from that. So we need some questions now. So now you guys have to do some work. Okay, Gemma has one. Hi, I'm particularly interested around investing in legacy fundraising. Um, I work with a lot of small organisations um, and it's generally known that you have to invest in legacy fundraising for quite a long time before you see returns. Um, but boards and chief execs are under massive pressure to get results now, 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 now. How would you explain to a board or a chief exec the need for investing in legacy fundraising and for having that patience to see it come to fruition after a number of years of effort? I, yeah, that's a, a good question. It's, it's often the case, trustees are often very short-sighted. And I understand why when you are struggling, as Lisa said, to pace the salaries at the end of the month or the end of the year, it's difficult to think long-term. But it's not that long-term. Legacy campaigns typically start paying off within three and a half years. That's not that long-term, because any charity should have a strategy which covers at least the next five to ten years. If you don't, by the way, have a strategy which covers the next five to ten years, go and do one. And so you should be thinking that actually as part of your, your medium-term strategy, Legacies is part of it. And the most convincing reason I can give to why the trustees should is because it's incredibly good value. You do general fundraising, the return on investment is four pounds for every pound you, you invest. Legacy fundraising is about 35 pounds for every pound you invest. It's ridiculously good value. And it works, and it's predictable. If you do it properly, it is utterly predictable. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the point about storytelling. Um, I'm a creative researcher, and, a, and I call myself a storyteller because lots of what I do is capturing stories and, and telling them. And I suppose I was just interested to hear a little bit more about the ways that you think we should share and tell those stories and what are the best ways to try to get them out there and get people listening to them and thinking about them. Sure. Um, so I can really only use my experience of just giving, but it's we have thousands of pages on our site and the 
Um, it's no secret that the pages that do well are the ones that, where the person is, is telling a story. Um, you look at marathon fundraisers as an example. You have people who sign up for a marathon almost the moment they've crossed the finish line of the previous year, and then they have this page which they have to curate and, and own for a year. And it's a story about how that person starts training, about how they buy their trainers. It's about how they um, you know, go through those first 5Ks and then the next 10Ks. And along that way, people will give because they're engaged and they want, they, you know, they want to, they're buying into that person's story. At the moment, we don't actually give charities a very good way of doing that on our site. And I think that's a, that's a criticism of our own service. Um, we've launched a campaigns product that, that is trying to do that. And what we've seen with that is, again, is the success comes from charities who uh, pick a very specific campaign where there is a, um, there's a, there's a starting point, there's a mission, and then there's a journey which they take the people along. Um, what I think is interesting now outside of our site is that there are so many tools now to be able to do this, right? It's so easy now to document in-field activities, whether it's you know, mobile phone technology, whether it's Snapchat, whether it's relaying images quickly from the field and sending them back to your CRM team so that they can send out newsletter late at night. It's the ability to react to the news. So if there's something going on in the news, you can, you can jump on that. You can own that story um, and convert it you know, for good for your own cause. I think, um, I think sometimes um, charities feel that this story has to be long. It has to be drawn out over a long time. I think you, could, you can be bold. You can, you, can, uh, you can come out with short, snappable, sort of uh, easily digestible content. I mean, that's, that's what the younger generation are consuming right now, right? I think, um, you know, look at, look at the, all the tools that are out there that you can use, particularly on mobile, because that's where people are spending their time. You know, look at Vine, look at Snapchat, look at how people are using Instagram to take people on journeys and, you know, in interesting, engaging content that then has a clear call to action at the end of it. Anything, would, would you add anything? Um, does anyone have a weekly call with their mum? Is it just me? Um, so I have a weekly call with my mum every Sunday evening and sometimes I'm really scrapping my brain knowing that my mum's going to call at about 8 o'clock every, every Sunday. And I think I haven't done anything this week. But actually I think that's very similar to the way that a lot of charities feel. And the difference, so the reason that Just Giving is so effective in what it does is because people are just telling their stories, they're just updating their mates on what they've done that week. And sometimes it could feel really mundane but that's really human. So I'd say as a charity, just think, what do I need to tell my mum about what I've been doing this week and, and tell them that story. But stop speaking as a charity and start speaking as the supporters that you're talking about or the beneficiaries that you're helping or the work that you're doing on the ground. But it doesn't have to be big, snazzy news. It could just be, I bought a new pair of trainers because, uh, you know, you know my back was hurting last week. So Something just, simple. Just thought of just as an example, if you wanted to go away and, and look at... Uh, an example that springs to mind is Child's Eye. Um, charity uh, based in Africa looking after um, uh, impoverished children. They do a great job of taking those children and... And I mean this in the nicest way, but turning those children into stories. Um, and off the back of that, driving support for their particular campaigns. They're, they're a really interesting, good example. And very, very sort of heartwarming. Can I just... I, I completely agree with what both people have said about those personal stories. I just want to give a slightly different perspective on it, I think. I think if you're telling stories as a charity, whatever medium you're doing it, you need to start with why. Don't start with what you do. Too many charities, I, I come in and I read, I'm sure you're the same looking at grant application, it starts with, we run courses for blah, blah, blah. And you think, I don't care. Why do you do it? What is the problem in the world that you are trying to solve? That's where you start. What is it that gets you out of bed in the morning? You know, we're a fundraising consultancy. That's what we do. The reason we do it is because we believe charities are the best agents of social change. And we think the best way we can support you is by helping you fundraise. That's why we do what we do. It's not, I mean, I could talk about, I go in and I advise charities on what they do. I help them write grant applications, yada, yada, yada. Everyone's already falling asleep. So talk about why. Start with that process. Why do you do what you do? And that's the heart of your story. I mean, I'll just reinforce that and say, I mean, we, at the Childhood Trust, we've only ever produced one video in three years, a one two-minute video. And we did that using no actors, using an empty flat, um, 
in a run-down part of London. Um, and it was why, the whole point was, why do we need to support kids in London who are living in poverty during the school holidays? It was a two-minute video. It cost £10,000 to produce. My trustees nearly fell off their chair. But we have raised, thanks to Alex at the back there on the big give, we have, we have raised over £1 million on the back of that £10 million. Uh, 10 million, that's 10,000. Must, must, must not have glass of wine before joining panel. Um, uh, one 10,000 pound video uh, has produced over a million pounds and it was purely not a kid in the video, obviously, because it'd be really awkward to show a, a genuinely poor child starving during the holidays. Um, but you try going without lunch for 42 days in a row. You know, um, and uh, that's what it means for a lot of these kids. And it was, you know, it's been really, really effective. So if you can tell that why story really, really easily, really well, then it really does work. Hello, just building on that storytelling um, mechanism. How would you kind of define the ethics of showing the beneficiary and maybe the suffering story to create empathy, but at the same time building on that story to kind of create the impact that you're pursuing? I think it's a very thin line between selling a story because it's actually the, the life of a person that deserves you know, respect and so on and so forth. So how do you deal with that kind of narrative? Yes, it's a difficult line, and it's a constant battle between finding it. Um, I give the example of a couple of people I know who work for a major... Or, this isn't being recorded, is it? Okay, can we... Okay, there is a certain organisation who will remain nameless, though, who work overseas with a lot of very vulnerable people. And there was a constant battle between the fundraising department who wanted to put out this very hard-hitting material... And the communications department says, you can't say that. You cannot say that. And the fact is, you have to say, okay, fine. We won't say that. We're not going to raise as much money. The fact is, at the end of the day, it is those hard-hitting stories that get people emotionally engaged. That is what gets the money. You have to make the line. You have to find that line. And you can't cross it because you don't want to exploit the people you're helping. That's absolutely fundamental. But there are ways of showing that problem. There's a very powerful video out there called Save the Cow. If you don't know anything about it, Google Alan Clayton, Save the Cow. And it shows how a campaign gets neutered because people say, oh, you can't say that. That's too hard hitting. And you realize that just through a few compromises, you end up with a completely neutered campaign. You've got to show there's a problem. If there isn't a problem, what the hell are you doing fundraising? And you've got to show that there are people facing that problem. And you can do it in an empowering way that says, look, with your help, they can overcome this problem. Look at what they can achieve with just a little bit of help. But if you don't say these pe people are facing death or torture or whatever it is, you've got no story. <laughs> so I'd um, just add two things. One is people do like telling their stories. So I would say if your beneficiary wants to tell their story, go ahead and let them and give the communications department their details if they want to argue about them telling their story. Um, on change.org, we have very, very powerful stories every single day. Um, we are not approaching anyone for those stories. They are proactively putting them out there. Um, the other thing that I would say is if you can't get a beneficiary, get someone who's working with that beneficiary to tell their story rather than the story of the beneficiary. So if you look at a lot of the work that MSF is doing at the moment, it's just incredible because they're getting people who are in the field to record themselves speaking live, you know, t telling them, telling MSF supporters what it's really like because people connect with real people and even if it's not the beneficiary themselves, at least they can see exactly where their money's going and why it's important. Can I just pick up on that? Sorry, I feel if I'm dominating. I just talk too much. Great example of exactly that. People give to people and people have mentioned that before. Anyone here heard of Stephen Sutton? Everyone has heard of Stephen Sutton. Stephen Sutton, well, virtually everyone. Okay, Stephen Sutton was a guy who died uh, about two years ago. He had cancer, and he had terminal cancer, 
and he decided his bucket list, one of his bucket list things was he wanted to raise £10,000 for the Teenage Cancer Trust. And he set up, and some of his friends set up a Facebook page, and it went viral. And he ended up, at the last count, I think it's raised £5.5 million. Now, if you'd gone to Teenage Cancer Trust and said, hey, we've got this great idea, we're going to take one of our young people, and we're going to set them up and say, they're going to be the figurehead for this campaign. Before they die, this guy wants to raise. That have got nowhere. But it came from the beneficiary. It came from the guy itself. They want to tell their story. Absolutely echo that. And if you encourage them, and if you make it clear that you can benefit from that sort of storytelling and that sort of fundraising, it's amazing what you can get. Yeah, sorry, sorry to come back to our, to our Summer Give video. What we did, because we, we couldn't show real children starving in Lewisham in, in the school holidays. But what we did instead was we went, uh, one of our trustees just conveniently happens to be an executive super head teacher. Um, and she went into a school in a, a very deprived area because she happened to be working there anyway. I think the, you know, the head teacher had you know, gone off on some sort of emotional breakdown or something. And so the lovely Dame Sylvia went in. And she corralled together some, well, you know, we would, we, would, we would call them affectionately street urchins who were in the school. And she sat down with them. She said, right, I'd like to talk to you all about what you're looking forward to during the school holidays, knowing that they were of a demographic that probably weren't actually looking forward to the school holidays. And because she was a lovely, and she is a really lovely, lovely person, um, these children are warm to her. They, they told her what, what it was like what it was really like and she very handily wrote it all down and we shared that with the director and no further scripting was required and we filmed an empty flat and we just showed the narrative of what these real children were said and at the beginning we had um, you know um, a script going up saying we spoke to we spoke to children about what school holidays mean to them and the rest of it is all entirely in their, their words. Originally, I had wanted real children's voices. Uh, I thought from a creative point of view, if we could have kids' voices talking it. But actually, it wasn't necessary in the end. Uh, it was authentic, and we showed the audience. You know, and the audience are intelligent. They would understand that you can't show real children. And if you showed actors playing the part of starving children, that would also be a bit horrid. But actually showing their words in children's handwriting on the screen did the trick. I'll say something because I haven't on this. I would only, I would only add. Um, I think there's also an authenticity now about homemade video. I think we've, we've gone kind of beyond with YouTube now. We've gone beyond this acceptance that everything has to be super flash and beautifully edited. Um, you know, everybody who's got a smartphone has got a more than powerful enough camera in their pocket now to shoot good quality film. There's no excuse that you can't edit this stuff on your own computer. Um, so d don't feel that you have to have a big budget in order to produce video content. If anything, um, the, the, the more authentic it is, I think the more likely it's to be consumed. Brilliant. Let me come round. I think we're only going to have probably one or two more questions. Then we have to stop. Hi. Um, I work for an international NGO, and it's got a slightly different question perhaps because I really like the idea of like people give to each other what Mandy said about like sending children s sending um, anybody that you know wants to support the charity to Syria for example to help on the field however in the charity that I work for it's just not possible to do that uh, just call it bureaucracy or call it is too big whatever you would like to call it it's just not possible and especially I think that supporting each other is more public fundraising or individual giving uh, in my understanding, and I work in corporate fundraising, so I was wondering, do you have any tips on how to make that more corporate eligible rather than individual giving? I'm not sure. I don't know if it's relevant for corporate good fundraising in quite the same way, is the simple answer. I yeah. think corporates have a different motivation. They do... The, Corporate mo motivation is about their image. It's about, I, I tell the story that when people are, it comes back to storytelling, I guess. I use, you know, when we tell the story, 
I use the example of Little Red Riding Hood as how you tell the story. And that is that there is always a wolf. What is the wolf in your story? The wolf is the threat. There is somebody who's threatened by that wolf, who is Little Red Riding Hood, and there's the hero who comes along and saves the, saves the day, and that's the donor. And that's how you start constructing your story. With corporate fundraising, the person in danger is usually the corporate, and they're facing a problem, and you are the hero coming along to solve that, whether it's bad PR, it's because their staff aren't engaged, or it's because they've, whatever the reason is, it's a different motivation. So I don't think it's quite as relevant. Sure, I understand, but uh, would there be an innovative way to make that eligible for corporate fundraising without, like, a way to make it attractive for corporates using what's the shift that I, from what I understand from Mamdi, there's like a shift where people try to give to each other rather than to charities. Is there a way to make it more innovative while you are pitching to corporates to make it eligible for corporates in an innovative way? Does that make sense? Or I, th I think the, o the only the immediate way I could think is if it's an employee or someone directly connected with yeah. that company. If you can say, hey, this person who works for you wants to go to Syria or whatever and do work, that's a possible connection. Okay. Does anyone else have a thought? Yeah, I, mean, I was going down the same line in my head there. I think, I think if you can do it, I think the, the power of match funding probably comes into the corporate thing where you can connect if you've got members of staff who um, you know who are doing, say a lot on just giving for a particular cause, and uh, then find that there's a common link, which can't be too difficult, that they work for the same employer. Then the the, the canny fundraiser could go to that employer and say, we've got five, ten, fifteen, or however many people running in our marathon for all this, they are, or whatever it is, or wanting to go to the jungle in Calais, or wanting to go to Syria. Um, how about you match it? And then that can become a corporate story of, you know, strife, you know, endeavour over strife and teamwork and, and people going the extra mile and all those wonderful corporate qualities that corporates try to say about their staff um, and actually make it real. Brilliant. Yeah, I, would, I would echo that. I think we see a lot of corporate, fund, uh, corporate matching for traditional fundraising where the end beneficiary is the charity. Um, now, obviously, I don't work for a corporate, but I see no reason why you couldn't just pick that model up and, and apply it to crowdfunding, which is typically a peer-to-peer -peer, um, giving process. Charity, uh, the corporate might ask some more stringent questions about where the fund's going, but ultimately, if you're actually the employee and they already trust you to, because they hire you, you you've, you've overcome a barrier. Um, there, there might be some more that have to be negated, but um, I can't see why you can't just pick up that approach and apply it to crowdfunding. Brilliant. I think we have one more... Um, hi, I'm Jackie. I um, normally work for the Greggs Charitable Foundation, Greggs the Bakers. Um, I've worked for them for 10 years, but I'm currently seconded working for business in the community as a business connector in the borough of Camden. And I've come here really to see the Impact Hub and just find out a bit more about um, what's going on. And really good. Um, really, f a couple of questions more from a, just a personal interest point of view rather than my, my roles. Um, Mandy was talking about the media negative, um, you know, charity stories that have been going around. And Bill talked about um, part of the future perhaps was the baby boomers, boomers. I wondered what the panel thought about the future of the traditional street charity the, the chuggers, the charity muggers, I just got stopped by two on the way here, and I think there's been a big backlash against them, and I, I wonder what the future is for that, because it obviously was a good source of fundraising for, for big charities. And also, um, sorry, um, but, oh, okay. Um, so first of all, I think we found our catering for next time. Greg's, Dawn, yeah. you, need to, you need to tap her up for catering. Yeah, yeah that would be great. <laughs> it's really interesting that, you said, oh, I came up here and I got mugged by two charity chuggers. So instantly there's this negativity. For uh, an established way of um, giving that has been going through the years. Now, I understand that ROI on these things is, is declining. I'm sure there's people in here who know a lot more than me about that. But it's, it's not obviously falling off a cliff that it's not still being, still being applied in the street. So um, part, of me, part of my business logic just says it works um, and... Um, businesses or charities are still trying to um, convert people into recurring givers, right? It, that's, the, that's the ultimate goal. I think what's interesting now is that 
Um, people expect more in an exchange. So an exchange of data, right? You, you're, you're saying, here's my recurring, um, here's my recurring details. Um, what, what's the exchange in return? Um, I think traditionally it used to be, you know, I know that you'll send me a postcard every year telling me what's been funded. I think that's changing now. A lot more people um, expect different things in terms of data exchange. Plus, on top, we've now got all these issues about uh, data compliance and, uh, and fundraising preference. I think that's going to, when that settles, and it's still being a lot of legislation is being made, I think that's going to change how that process works quite, quite substantially, particularly if certain charities want to start making that process uh, more online in the street, if that makes sense. So, you know, with the advent of Apple Pay and things like that, you can see how people can try and make that process a little bit more smooth, a little bit, uh, take some of the friction out of it. So chugging isn't new. It's existed for over 100 years, and it used to be women, because we weren't allowed to be employed, who stood on the street selling flowers and cakes and, you know, lovely things, and no one found them a pain. Um, because it was a nice exchange, you got a flower, you got a cake, you got whatever you wanted, and then you walked away and you felt good about yourself. Um, can I just have a show of hands for anyone who receives communications from a charity that they enjoy? Okay, so for me, the future is, is that. So for me, the reason that chugging is really annoying is because only 50% of you put your hand up then. So it's not about what happens to you on the street, it's what happens next. And actually, if you realise that the interaction that you were having on the street was going to lead to something that gave you a long-term relationship that you really enjoyed, then it's something you'd be really willing to sign up for. Similarly, when people say that charities are spamming them by email, spam to me is something that you don't want to receive. And it just means that they're getting the communications wrong. So for me, the future, if, if charities are going to carry on being successful, is that they learn how to communicate effectively with their supporters. And that's the only way that any method of fundraising can exist in the long run. The reason that um, the return on investment is falling on chugging is because it's not people signing up on the streets, that's still high, it's just people will cancel really quickly. And it's because the communications afterwards are rubbish. Yeah, agree with that, absolutely. The, the communications is terrible. It's largely because they never get to the why they do it. It's all about what we do. They never get people to buy into the why. The three best chugging things I've seen are all slightly different. I think this is the future of chugging. It's not so much about the guy with the clipboard or the, the iPad or whatever. It's going to do things slightly differently. Three very quick examples. Amnesty, brilliant, brilliant campaign they did with a VR headset. And they had a guy out in um, Syria, in Aleppo, with an iPhone, you can video these anywhere, filming, beamed back live to a, to a VR headset. People watch them in the street, they look around, this is what's happening in Aleppo now, this is why, this is why we need your support. Brilliant campaign. Secondly was the Children's Society. They didn't bother with traditional um, chuggers, they sent out street music ma musicians, magicians, to do tricks, to do card tricks, close-up things, to get people involved. Yeah, and as they were doing it, they were doing these disappearing card tricks. And they were saying, do you know how many children go missing in London every year? And it just got people engaged. This is why, because children are going missing. That's why we do what we do. And the third final one, I can't remember the name of the charity that's been bugging me. It's why I left it till last. But it was, it's a charity that works in Africa, in some of the poorest countries in Africa. And they put a display on the South Bank. Um, and it was basically two huts. This is a hut without our support. This is a hut with, your, with our support. It's got a bed, it's got stuff on the wall, it's got stuff to eat. And people just wandered in and looked round. But it wasn't quite as invasive as somebody coming up on the street and saying, supporters. People came because they thought, oh, that looks interesting. And again, it was got them more engaged. Gave them a chance to say, this is why we do what we do. Like you said, Jamie, it's that offering an exchange that you guys were talking about, isn't it? And, it? and to me, it's about an experience. Those things are giving somebody an experience, and it's building empathy, which is one of the things I think we need to try harder at doing, because I think clearly we've now voted in two conservative governments, so kind of reckon the empathy element's not kind of working out so well for us right now. So I think they're really brilliant points, and I really enjoyed listening to all of your... Um, 
your thoughts and suggestions and ideas. And I, I love that also what you guys have been talking about here. Often I go to events and I think, I can't apply that to my charity because most of the charities I work with are tiny, tiny, and they don't have much money. But I think you could take a lot of these ideas and do them with very minimal budget just by using ingenuity and lots of sort of energy and people who are passionate about what they want to do. And just as a sort of a little bit of a plug, really, we talked a lot about storytelling, and Jude Habib, who I think has now had to leave, but she was here earlier, is running an amazing event in September called Being the Story. And it's a full day where she's getting people to actually share their stories, and it's part of what she normally does on her social media exchange event. And so I've had a preview of it at that event, and it was just, it's something that stayed with me, because it's these personal stories from the first person, people sharing part of them, really. And so if you guys want some help with how you do the stories and how you, and you could chat to some of the people there who've been brave enough to tell their story and find out how that felt for them and what support they were given, that event would be a really good one to try out. And then there's also a really cool event called Bar Camp Not For Profit, which is going to be in August, which is basically an unconference. So it's sort of exhilarating and terrifying in equal measure because it's free, but you have to make the conference. So you turn up, and if you want to do a topic, so say you want to do a gamification topic, you'll probably end up having to run that topic. So you create a facilitated group and people share their thoughts and ideas together. It's an amazing event to try. So um, I just wanted to, again, thank the panel. If we can give them another big round of applause. Thank you so much. So we're going to have a break and then we're going to do a little bit of small groups and then, then we'll close. So thanks for all your questions.